great show. Keep it going. For Anthony DeVito! Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. What's up? Hello. How are you? What's going on? Yeah, so I'm going to do uh, taping an album and doing a special with you guys. So we're all here. We're all white. Let's have a good time. <laughs> when it turns into that all of a sudden, I'm just like, come on, guys. Let's have a good rally. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm 39. Um, thank you, nobody. Thank you. Once. Still, don't, don't, don't. You had your chance. One sad clap. Like, yeah, all right, sure. Man, whatever. Almost 40. You want to want a party? Come on. <laughs> No, I like it, though. People grumble about getting older. I love it, because my whole makeup has changed as a person. You know, like, any moment when I was younger, horniness could strike. And now, sadness can. And I love it. <laughs> Man, my, like, my early 20s, I'd be dumbfounded. I'd be like, hmm, why am I getting a boner at a funeral? <laughs> But in my late 30s, I'm like, whoa, why am I crying in Target? <laughs> this is exhilarating. Something about this aisle. Oh, we'll never know. <laughs> you just care about nothing as you get older. You know? My girlfriend uses her vibrator after sex. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm basically the warm up act for her wand. <laughs> I'm like, that was a great show. And she's like, who's ready for your headliner? <laughs> Mr. Hatachi. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me at all. When I was younger, I used to look at a vibrator like an indictment of my manhood. <laughs> now I see one, it's like FEMA showing up for disaster relief. <laughs> She's like, let me point you to the problem area. Uh, it's got a lot of flaps, so I don't know how you do on flaps. Seven or eight, at least. Flap count, high. Flap, flap count. I just like saying flaps a lot in that show. I'm, really... I'm learning more about sex as I get older. Uh, like I learned when my girlfriend has an orgasm, it's got nothing to do with me. Zero. <laughs> Couldn't be any more clear by the way we finish. For me, I look right at her. My eyes are wide open. She does the exact opposite. She closes her eyes and removes herself from the present. Where she goes, nobody knows. Somewhere cold, she's always shivering. That's... I think it's the upside down. Like, I have an orgasm. She conjures one from some other dimension and just wrestles it back to the Milky Way. I always think she's gonna come back and tell me a secret she learned. Like, I'll be like, was it good for you? She's like, oh, I know who killed John Bonet. <laughs> Glad you guys laughed at that. Because uh, <laughs> not every crowd knows who John Bonet is. And then I have to explain her. They're like, who's that? I'm like, a little girl who was murdered. And they're like, is that the joke? I'm like, I guess so. I don't know. It's my first time. Uh, I don't have a handle on things. But, you know, I'm trying to work. You know, I'm trying to... Uh, you know, I'm trying to better myself, work out. Eh, I'm not really doing it, but it's a nice thing to say, you know? <laughs> um, but no, I asked my girlfriend recently, I was like, what do you find most attractive about me? And her face was like, I don't know what to do here. Uh, I thought we were getting along. I know why you're doing this. A nice Saturday cooking, brunch was good. Uh, <laughs> so she just panicked and she just goes, oh, confidence. <laughs> right, right, what a creative way to call me hideous. <laughs> But I don't just think it's that I'm gross. I think most men are gross. So women, as an evolutionary tool, had to start finding qualities outside the physical hot in guys just to keep our species going. Just staring at men like, either I figure out how to get wet off leadership skills. <laughs> or, or, I guess we're all dead, so I don't know. Can you weld? Okay, come inside. Take your shoes off. 
but you know, we've been going out for a while. The relationship works because we do different things for each other. Like primarily my role is I help her find her phone. Uh, always in her hand, 100% of the time. And in turn, she keeps me alive. That is what, she's like, you gotta drink water. I'm like, I drank it yesterday. She's like, it's an everyday thing, idiot. I'm just too oblivious as a person. I go hours without a single thought in my head. My girlfriend thinks I'm quiet because I'm wise. I'm just looking at colors. Uh, she's like, what are you thinking about? I'm like, that's red. That's blue. I'm like, what are you thinking about? She's like, our future. I'm like, is it blue? Because I can help. We'll do it. She's a big uh, feminist. Uh, a couple years ago, we went to the Women's March together. Yeah, it was nice. We got into a fight there. That was awesome. It was great. What I'd call an away game. <laughs> and I was there as an ally for women, but now I'm furious at one of them. So it was conflicting. Uh, it did affect my chanting. Because I was marching, I was like, yes, all women, but not this bitch. She's <laughs> being so mean to me. I made her sign. She didn't tell you that. But I like, I like being in a relationship. I hated being single. I hated being set up by people. This happened 10 years ago when I was single. So I found uh, a pimple on one of my testicles. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was herpes. I had sex in a year. I was like, this is herpes. It's a slow rollout. I know herpes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I go to this doctor in my neighborhood. I drop my pants. I show him. I was like, it's herpes. <laughs> He was like, it's not herpes, it's cystic acne. I was like, how do you know that? He goes, because you have the same thing on your back. Why is your shirt off? <laughs> and I was like, because I got nervous. Uh, <laughs> so, the whole time he's inspecting them, I'm making small talk with him. I start telling him how I'm a comedian, how I'm single, where I live. Basically, we're on a date. Uh, <laughs> So at the end of it, he writes down a phone number on a prescription pad, he hands me the phone number, and I was like, oh, is this the pharmacy? And he goes, no, this is my daughter's phone number. She's single, she loves comedy, you should call her. I know, what a terrible father. Uh, unethical doctor. Incredible wingman. Uh, a Bud Light legend, dare I say. <laughs> And man, I did call her, and she did not answer. Uh, <laughs> probably because she asked her dad, she's like, what do you know about this guy? And he's like, he doesn't have herpes. Uh, <laughs> wink. She's like, I think I'm good. Stop setting me up with your friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm at an age, like, all my friends, everybody's married at this point. I go to so many weddings. I went to one, I didn't know anybody at the wedding. It was one of my girlfriend's friends. And uh, so I, when people asked what I did for a living, I just made everything up. Uh, I told some people I'm a cop. I told other people I manage a gym. <laughs> and then I told other people I'm a philanthropist. But the problem is I have no idea what a philanthropist is. But I know what a paleontologist is and that's what I thought a philanthropist was. <laughs> All wedding, people are just coming up to me and they're like, hey, what do you do for a living? I was like, I'm a philanthropist. They're like, how'd you fall into that? I was like, I saw Jurassic Park. <laughs> Things clicked, my man. <laughs> I do, I want to get married. It's just that marriage seems easy to get lazy because there's no ending. The terms are forever. <laughs> Marriage would be more successful if it was like politics, where every four years, your partner votes to keep you in office. Cause then I'd check the date before bad behavior. I'd be like, hmm, they're holding this fart. It's an election year. I just wanna be a two-term husband, uh, despite what polls say. By polls, I mean her friends and family. And my grandma, she's on me about getting married. I, I love her, but very annoying. Uh, she's 95, she just harasses me. She's just like, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? It bothers me, because I never pressure her about her next milestone. Uh, <laughs> super chill about that. I rarely bring it up. Uh, 
She's like, you're 39. When are you going to take the next step? I'm like, you're 95. When are you going to take your last one? Like, oh, how could he? I know, I know. Where's my save the date? You're right, guys. It's not nice of her. You're right. She's in a nursing home. She got in there because a couple of years ago, she had a surgery. Doctors were like, at her age, she's never going to make it. So my family thought it was going to be the end. It wasn't, but I thought it was. So I visit her in the hospital every day. I was by her bedside. She was on a lot of drugs. Took her a lot of effort to talk. She could only say one thing a day. So she popped up. This is all she had one of the days. She looks at me. She just goes, Anthony, at night, doctors come in this hospital and have sex with everyone in here. <laughs> Yeah, then she closed her eyes and went back to bed. And I was like, you gotta wake up and say one more thing. When people ask about your last words, I am not lying. They're like, do you remember what her words were? I'm like, I remember what they weren't. Uh, <laughs> was it a malpractice conspiracy theory about a brothel hospital? She mentioned a sunset. <laughs> Oh, by the way, I'm Italian. I know I look like a Turkish freedom fighter. But... <laughs> My last name is DeVito, and because I'm in show business, people just assume Danny DeVito is my dad, which would be flattering if he was a neutral looking human being. That is not a compliment. He played the penguin. <laughs> They're like, ah, I just think you could be from the bloodline of a human egg. That's all. Or would that be upsetting for you to hear? <laughs> my dad, actually, he died when I was a baby. And uh, by my mom, she never wanted me to feel different. So every year, she would give me a Father's Day card. And she would go, you're your own dad. <laughs> Which made me feel different. Uh, <laughs> Which just gave me an excuse for bad grace. <laughs> My grandma'd be like, another C, Anthony? I'd be like, you try juggling multiplication and raising a son. <laughs> Not easy on us kid parents. It's hard being a single parent. You're just on your own as a person. So sixth grade, my mom made my Halloween costume. She just poked two holes in a white sheet. Eyes a ghost. <laughs> But I loved baseball so much as a kid, she traced New York Yankees logos all over the sheet. She hands it to me, she goes, you're the Yankee ghost. You haunt the stadium. That's why as a parent, you might need a partner. Uh, just to have someone to run your ideas by. Uh, it was a rough draft that went right to print because no eyeballs got on that thing. My mom didn't know they make Yankees bed sheets. I went to school, I just look weird and poor. Uh, my mom, yeah, she's crazy. Uh, all pandemic, she got really into this subtitled Korean uh, Netflix show, Vincenzo. And because of that, my Italian mother has just pivoted into Asian person. And I used to be like, cultural appropriation is wrong. But when you're 75, it's adorable. Uh, <laughs> She drinks sake every night. Her fridge is filled with dragon fruit. She is one of those cats with the wavy arm in her bedroom, like a business. And I've heard people be like, I've read a book. I'm coming out of this pandemic, a different guy. My mom is like, hold my rice wine. I am now a proud Korean woman. So, yeah, she's the best though. She is, uh, she's on me, my mom is on me about having kids. And I don't know what to do, because I financially support my mom. I pay all her bills. So I don't know how to tell her that I can't afford children unless she is out of the picture. Uh, <laughs> she's like, I'd do anything for a grandkid. I'm like, anything? Even the ultimate sacrifice? <laughs> I was raised by all women. It was my mom, my grandma, and four aunts. And because of that, guys think I have insights on how to hit on women. They'll be like, you gotta be good with girls. It's like, why? You think my aunt sat me down? Like, here's how you fuck us. Uh, you know? Some tips to bang Bev, maybe. You know? She's not gonna like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, man, skeevy dudes, horny older brothers, they teach you how to hit on women. Women teach you how to listen to women. Take you home from a bar? I have no idea. 
you got a thyroid problem. Let's talk about it. Let's get in there. Let's name it. Let's raise it. <laughs> My uncle, he was the only guy around, and he had, he had no parental ability whatsoever, but he always wanted an assessment of his performance. He'd always be like, how am I doing? I'd be like, you're drinking and driving. Uh, this is how you're doing. Uh, so, high school, I made the basketball team. My uncle goes, we gotta get you a jock strap. <laughs> if you've never seen a jock strap, it is a plastic cup for your genitals. And then it is a coarse and difficult thong in the back. <laughs> it's like a bungee cord attached to a salad bowl, and you're like, who's ready to shoot hoops? <laughs> We go to Foot Locker together to get this thing. Foot Locker employee looks at me and he goes, what's the size of your crotch? And nobody had ever asked me that before. I just stared at him nervously. He looked at my uncle. My uncle didn't know what to do. My uncle just goes, he's Italian. What do you think? And it worked. The guy went, say no more. He goes to the back, comes back minutes later, largest jock strap that they make, the Italian model, El Domo. And looking back, none of that should have happened at all. That is not a position you put a child in, not a Foot Locker employee. And my uncle should have known that is not a position you put an uncle in. The Foot Locker employee is like, young child, what's the size of your crotch? And I'm like, this man knows. <laughs> and the employee's like, is that your dad? I'm like, that is not my dad. No. Calls himself Uncle Paul. But I should call him Uncle Pal. He's a weird dude. My uncle's like, how am I doing? I'm like, you're gonna get arrested in Foot Locker. Uh, the first of its kind. <laughs> They're gonna blow the whistle. <laughs> My family, they're all conservative too. I'm not politically. But I think we differ more because of our age. You know, my mom is 75, I'm 39. We are focused on different things. Like her biggest fear are immigrants. And my biggest fear is she'll say that to someone. So, uh, it's where we part ways. Come back and fracking the economy. But I'm like everybody else, where I hate how the country is so divided. That's why I've been clinging to shows where opposites get along for inspiration. I watched this Netflix show, Unlikely Animal Friends. It's great, just a golden retriever hangs out with a horse and you're like, if they can make it work, we can, that's uh, for sure. That's why someone's gotta write a show that highlights common ground in people. Someone's gotta make unlikely human friends. Just a Japanese toddler hangs out with a German pastry chef. And they're like, oh, we both like cake. Just a feminist and a skinhead, like, well, we have the same haircut. <laughs> Just a gay guy and a homophobic guy, like, well, we're both gay. Uh, it's great, it's great. I just don't get far-right Republicans that don't want to protect us against global warming, but then still want to go to war with foreign invaders. Every hurricane I've seen comes from overseas. <laughs> they do more damage than terrorists, but they'll go after ISIS. So, think if we just gave hurricanes Muslim names, they would be on board. <laughs> Hurricane Michael, they're like, fuck climate change. Hurricane Usama, they're like, bro, we gotta recycle. Yeah, just, <laughs> I don't like the beard on that hurricane, that's all. I'm category scared. <laughs> And whoever runs, they all say they're a man of the people. That's such nonsense. They all make $400,000 a year on the job. You wanna be a man of the people? Make what I make. You give a speech, you get two drink tickets. That's it, flat fee, across the board. Man, I just want someone from my group. I'm more poor than I am white. <laughs> I just, I'm excited for the first female or gay president, but I want the first broke one. Just up there like, yeah, we can't do away with Medicaid because I am on it. <laughs> so, no. Just, don't, <laughs> don't want to be the first president assassinated by their healthcare plan. That's all, come on. 
Healthcare, man, it's so expensive. I find when I go to the doctor, I'm actually hoping to have the thing that I'm there for just to justify the cost of the visit. Just sitting there like, for $1,200, this better be testicular cancer. Give me good news, stop. But I do think if we had more uh, fiscal transparency, we'd have more public empathy. Cause like, it's weird. The only group of people we know their exact salaries are pro athletes. I think we do that on purpose so we could use the large amount of money they make against them to be mean to them whenever they screw up. You know how many times I'm watching basketball with a friend of mine, guy misses a jump shot, they're all over him. They're like $12 million a year. This asshole can't put a ball in a basket. <laughs> I think if we knew the exact salaries of lower wage jobs, we would use the little amount of money that they make to be nicer to them when they screw up. Like everything would be different if we knew what teachers made. We'd be like, for that salary, I'd fuck a kid too. <laughs> right, right guys, right. With warmth and love and tenderness and a caring touch and a gentle eye. <laughs> it's my favorite joke to tell by far of all time. <laughs> Because everybody comes in too hot. They're like, yeah, teachers. Then they're like, no, no, I'm not that person anymore. <laughs> but people think if you have money, you're immune to problems, which isn't true. Because I am, I'm a big basketball fan. NBA players, they make millions. They've tried to be outspoken about mental health. People are vicious to them. They're like, how could you be rich and have depression? It's like, I don't know, but that sounds unfixable. Uh, at least if you're poor and have depression, there's hope. Your life can get better. To be rich and have depression, there is nowhere to go. Imagine being sad in a hot tub, sitting there like, I don't know where my tears end and the bubbles begin. Oh, it's all wet. I'm so confused and tall. <laughs> But yeah, mental health is important, especially for men. Because guys give women a bad rap about being overdramatic, but every mass shooter's been a man. So <laughs> when women get upset, they just change their hair. <laughs> men change the population. <laughs> women are like, I think I'll die my roots. Men are like, people need to die. And I'm the one to carry out God's wrath. <laughs> That's why you don't need to ban guns, just ban men from buying them. And if you want to kill someone, you got to convince a woman to do it for you. <laughs> and every mass shooter can't convince a woman to come back to their apartment. So we would be okay. That's their big thing, you know? It'd be fine. Yeah, I'm in therapy. Uh, nothing to do with that last joke. Nothing, guys. Absolutely nothing. No correlation whatsoever. I wouldn't try to read into it. Thank you, man. Thank you. Shout out to therapy over there. I like that. Good for you. <laughs> It's great, it really is. But therapists sometimes, they have you do things that make you feel worse. Like my therapist has had me name the voice in my head to take the gravity away. That made me feel horrible. That's where my life is at. My friends are starting families, picking out names for their kids. I'm doing that for the voice in my head. They're like, we're going with Charlie for a boy. I'm like, I'm going with Kevin for my brain noise. So I think we're like the same guy, really. I try to feel better about myself, but people just say things to me that takes me back down. Like, uh, my girlfriend's mom said I have an asexual vibe. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, <laughs> and then I asked my mom and she was like, no, you have a very sexual vibe. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> my girlfriend's mom's like, I can't picture your penis. My mom's like, I can't stop. Uh, the visions. <laughs> But even with that, I don't have any sex stuff. I'm not kink shaming anybody, but I'm just glad I'm not in a bondage just because I don't have the money for that equipment. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to use what's in the house. I'd be like, oh, sorry, we couldn't afford a whip, so I gotta go with this old ethernet cable. Uh, <laughs> better get drunk and try the router, but it's got those edges, and I don't wanna bruise it. I have anxiety, that's what I have, so. <laughs> I've been taking baths. I love a bath. Because <laughs> I get to be three different versions of a person as the bath goes on. Because when I'm just sitting there in water, I'm like, I'm a cowboy in a whorehouse. <laughs> but then I add bubbles and I'm like, I'm a woman in a tough marriage. <laughs> and then the water slowly drains and I'm like, I'm a dead musician. <laughs> it's great. Hey, it's great. 
Oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and I've been doing these uh, guided meditations, but I had to switch from the girl's voice to the guy's voice because she would turn me on too much. And I would start masturbating every time. Uh, just felt like I was abandoning the program. <laughs> She'd be like, breathe in and out. I'd be like, I'm gonna go rogue here. Uh, <laughs> gonna jerk off and fall asleep. In uh, this session, a little early, Samantha. Cause that's what the pandemic taught me, that I have anxiety. Six months into it, I wanted my girlfriend's edibles on an empty stomach. And then uh, I watched Rihanna's Fenty fashion show. And then I had a full blown panic attack. <laughs> and my mind just gave me the symptoms of a heart attack. And my body was like, we're high, if you say so. You are running things. Uh, so I freaked out, I called 911. Yeah, the lady picked up, I just went, I'm a man on drugs. And I was so high, she goes, okay, what kind? And I went, an Italian man. I don't understand. She was like, no, what kind of drugs, you idiot? <laughs> Thinking I was gonna say meth or heroin the way I was acting. And I was like, turns out my girlfriend's weed is a little strong for me. She's like, you're not a man or on drugs. Uh, you don't sound Italian, young lady. But when you call 911, the paramedics have to show up. So these EMT workers come to my apartment. They got thick New York accents. This guy's taking my blood pressure. I am scared. I was like, how high is it? And he goes, bro, honestly, I thought it was gonna be higher. Cause you're acting like a little boy. So basically I called 911. I was like, hey, send someone over from Staten Island to call me a pussy. Uh, I think that'll do the trick for old Anthony. <laughs> I live in Queens in New York. And at uh, the beginning, it was the epicenter in the pandemic. And uh, everyone was like, don't go to the hospital for anything but COVID. But a couple of years ago, my hair started thinning. So my doctor gave me Propecia, but she was like a side effect of Propecia could be impotence. So she gave me Viagra, which I never used. <laughs> But then two weeks into quarantine, my girlfriend's like, take a Viagra. I'm sick of puzzles. Let's do this thing. Uh, so I took a full one, forgetting it's a pill for a 93-year-old with impotence. Not a 39-year-old sexual phenomenon. So I took one, we have sex, I finish, I still have an erection. I'm like, this has not happened in 11 years. My girlfriend's like, I can't go again. I was like, medically, I think we have to. Uh, Dr. Fauci's orders, the CDC says. So we have sex again, I finish, I still have an erection. I'm on WebMD, like, should I be concerned? My girlfriend goes, just sleep it off. I was like, I don't think it's that kind of injury, but uh, I like where your head's at. So I go to sleep, I wake up, I still have an erection. At that point, it was like a horror movie. I was like, how is the doll back in the cabinet? I threw her out. 24 straight hours, I did nonstop erection during the height of the pandemic, living in the epicenter, thinking I have to go to the hospital and not for the coronavirus. Just showing up to the ER, the nurse is like, do you have COVID? And I'm like, worse. I have a boner that will not quit. So where is my ward? For the perpetually erect, where do we go exactly? <laughs> yeah, New York is fun, man. It's a very liberal town. Uh, I, like I used to work at the Apple store before stand up and very progressive, a little too progressive, I would say. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to make sure every group was included working there. They hired the elderly. Uh, my favorite group of people, just not for an electronics store. Uh, just running around like, are these all radios? Korea was crazy. I'm sweaty. <laughs> just like, please go in the break room. You are scary people. <laughs> but it was good because it offered perspective on how meaningless those problems are. Because customers would walk in and they would just be like, my phone is dead. <laughs> And the old people be like, yeah, so are all my friends. <laughs> I can't put Ethel in a bag of rice and bring her back to life. I wish I could, poor thing. <laughs> I 
And I, would, I used to work with a lot of atheists, too. And I, you know, I'm not religious at all. But some atheists are so mad at God. It's like, why are you angry at a thing you don't even believe in? I don't think Bigfoot's real. I'm on the forest every day. Like, this shit doesn't add up, you guys. Look at the sticks, and why is he so fuzzy, huh? We need answers. Because <laughs> a friend of mine, she was talking to me, she was like, how come Jesus is the son of God, but also God? I was like, because the guys that wrote the Bible were bad writers. That's why none of them went on to write other things. That's why none of them put their last name on it. They're like, just put down Luke. Uh, I don't want any of this getting back to me. So a lot of nonsense about salt back there on the mountain. He makes that wine, you go nuts. But then, you know, I gotta do shows in places that are so conservative. I was in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Super small town, so small. They were so excited, they just got Uber. Uh, but then they only had one driver, so. I was like, you don't have Uber, you have Sarah. That is not a ride share, that's an individual. Uh, but there's just no options in those places. Cause I was asking her, I was like, where should I go eat? She was like, you gotta go to the restaurant. End of sentence. Uh, I think that's why a lot of those towns aren't pro-choice. They've never made a choice. <laughs> You're like, where should I hang out? They're like, the river. You're like, where should I buy clothes? They're like, the store. You're like, what should I do with this baby? They're like, the river. <laughs> yeah, you guys are great. It's, you know, I don't know. People are like, everyone's so sensitive. Like, as a comedian, I'm supposed to hate cancel culture but it keeps opening doors for me, so I don't really know how to feel. Uh, <laughs> and my mom, you know, she gets nervous that something like that could happen to me. I know how to tell her, I'm not in any danger. I'm not successful. <laughs> She's like, what if you get canceled? I was like, I haven't been scheduled, so I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, comedy, it's so fun, man. But uh, the only thing, you will just sell yourself out if it means getting fans. So I was doing a podcast a couple of years ago, really popular, could have been a game changer for me. First half hour, I hadn't said a word. I just said nothing for the conversation. One of the comics was talking about stealing, I never stole. Another comic was talking about being Puerto Rican, I never been Puerto Rican. Uh, so I was like, all right, whatever comes up next, I have to get in there. And then the host goes, what's the weirdest thing anyone's ever masturbated with? And I was like, now's my time. Uh, so before I was born, my mom had breast cancer. She had a single mastectomy. So she only had one boob for a little while. So she had this fake boob thing in the house. Don't jump ahead, uh, live in the moment. Let's be here tonight, go to your breath, put your phones away. <laughs> and when I was younger, I didn't know what it was. I used to wear it on my head and dance around. I call it my squishy hat and the neighbors would come and throw change and we'd make rent. <laughs> But one time, I took my squishy hat when I was a teenager, I wrapped it around my penis, I used it as a lubricant till life finds a way. Yeah, you don't like hearing it? I don't like saying it, so who are you? This isn't a proud moment for me. But this is the only thing I said after a half hour of not talking. And I thought it was gonna kill. Instead, stunning silence. One of the comics went, what's wrong with you? The second comic went, I don't feel safe. And then the host goes, don't ever say that again to anyone, ever. And it hit me in that moment. Man, not only did I do a bad thing, I made it infinitely worse. What's more horrific, jerking off with your mom's fake cancer poop or being like, I hope this gets my name out there. Uh, and it works. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the strangest time claps I've ever been a part of in comedy. One guy clapped, everyone goes, I guess we clap. I don't know. <laughs> but no, a year later, this guy came up to me at a party. He was like, you're Anthony DeVito, right? I was like, yeah. He goes, I heard you on a podcast. <laughs> and I was like, which one? He was like, you know the one. <laughs> The only other thing with stand-up, you never want to tell people you're a comedian. People just always want to tell you jokes. Um, 
So I had this uh, Uber driver, uh, this Armenian guy in Los Angeles a couple years ago, finds out I'm a comic, he gets so excited. <laughs> he goes, whoa, you're a comedian. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I've got two jokes for you. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. <laughs> And then he goes, well, one's more like a sad tale. And I was like, go on. <laughs> this is what he said verbatim. He goes, there I was fighting in the Iran-Iraq war. You guys know how jokes begin. Uh, <laughs> knock, knock, who's there? Combat. <laughs> so he keeps going and he says, I was wounded in battle. So they took me to a hospital. But there was another soldier who had his head blown clean off. They took us both to the same hospital. There was a crazy mix up there. They thought that soldier was me, so they shipped his headless body to my mother to bury, and she did. There was a funeral, the whole town came out. I didn't know about any of this. I called her a week later. She thought I was calling from beyond the grave. And I was like, holy shit, man, what's your other joke? He goes, ah, sometimes when I go to Starbucks and they don't know my name, I tell them I'm famous opera singer, Andrea Bocelli. And I was like, this guy does it all as a comedian. What range? Schindler's List meets Jackass? He's incredible. He's a pro. I'll tell you this last story, then go. Um, yeah, I went to college actually for architecture and I only picked architecture because when I was 16, my aunt was on her deathbed. She asked what I was gonna do to make the family proud. I just got nervous. I said architecture and then she lived and they never forgot. So, 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 and I knew I wanted to do comedy. So freshman year, our, worth our entire grade, we had to design a building where on the ground floor was retail space and the top floor were apartments. So I wanted to do stand-up. My idea was a store where you rent old people for parties. And <laughs> then they live in the apartments above. It's like a work stay. Uh, so I go to hand in my drawings at the end of the semester. My professor goes, you don't hand them in, you hang them up. Everyone does a project presentation in front of the whole class of visiting architect and the dean. And I was like, that is a curveball. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, so the presentation starts and I went last. So I'm just watching my classmates kill and I am laughing because nobody knows what I'm about to do. But I do and things will be different. So they find that they call my name and I had done zero public speaking at the time. You know, you're driving, you get pulled over by a cop. You're just nervous. So you just tell them everything you've ever done in your life. That's what I did with this project. At one point I went, here's where we weigh the old people for pricing. They're vegetables, that's how we treat them. That is a direct quote. Uh, and then the apartment part was unfinished, nothing was labeled. At one point I just said, I think I'll make that area a wrestling ring. Too early to tell right now. So when I got done, everybody is just looking at me and it kind of hits me in that moment. I'm like, I think I just failed college. That's probably over for me. So then no one says a word. The visiting architect walks up to the drawings. He looks back at me. He looks at the class and he just goes, Anthony, I just don't think it's a good idea to put the bedroom so close to the wrestling ring. <laughs> And then he said, because it's going to bother the old people when they're trying to sleep. And I was like, he's funnier than me. I do not stand a chance out there. You guys were so much fun. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you so much. For our show, thank you guys so much for coming out. We've got a second show coming out. We're so excited to get out of the show. We really appreciate it.